Good morning, everybody. Uh, very excited to introduce our guest speaker today, Mark Hayes. He's been with us for, I guess, the last 24 hours here at the high school. Uh, he spoke with our guidance counselors, and then he met with uh, a handful of our athletes, 150, 200 of our athletes yesterday afternoon, and then met with parents last night. Uh, Mark Hayes uh, delivers uh, a great message, he delivered a great message to our students and to our parents about effective communication uh, and what that looks like from parent to student student to teacher, teacher to coach, uh, student to coach as well. Uh, Mark went to Howard University where he played football and uh, after graduating from Howard University has been in media and television for 30 years delivering daily news uh, all over the country. And uh, through those experiences, he's interviewed the likes of George Clooney, Will Smith, and uh, has learned so much about interpersonal communication through his experiences. He also raised two Division I athletes, um, one played football at Howard University and the other one played ice hockey at the University of Maine. So two diverse experiences. Uh, yeah, then you'll, you'll appreciate that. We do have a, uh, what's their mascot? Black bears. I was going to say bobcats. Black bears. Uh, so we do have a fellow black bear here in the building. Uh, but without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Hayes. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Where's our fellow black bear alum? All right, you win the prize. I didn't bring anything, but I'll send you some swag. Thanks so much for being here this morning. What a pleasure. Thanks for coming to work. I didn't know if people were going to show up. They mentioned possible snow in Atlanta, where I live. They mentioned snow. Nobody goes anywhere, all right? We just hunker down. We stay home. We go. We buy the milk, the eggs, the bread. We make French toast. We go nowhere. But thank you so much for having me this morning. Pleasure to be here. Glad I didn't need the thermal underwear. I'm glad I'm surviving. I was watching the game Saturday night thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to Philly. It is cold there. That looks cold. So just the thought of cold scares me. So flying from Atlanta to Bangor, Maine was really <laughs> tough to watch hockey games. It never warmed up in the arena, just to let you know. But I am so excited to be here with you this morning. I have some tips and some news you can use, a little bit of insight. Feel free to ask me questions. Fire away. I'm an open book. I never met a conversation that I didn't like, which is how I ended up with this microphone in my hand this morning. So varsityconnects.com is my company, and we'll get to a little bit about how we got here. 30 years as a television news veteran, worked in some amazing cities, Atlanta, Dallas, Denver, Detroit. Is anybody from Denver? Oh my gosh, what an amazing city. If you haven't been, please get out to Denver. Go to Red Rocks for a sunrise service. What a beautiful city, what a smart city. Just amazing people there. My hockey player was born there in 1995. My wife and I would go back in a minute. As a matter of fact, my wife did law school while we were in Denver um, at CU Boulder in two and a half years with two kids under the age of six. So that's the better half. Um, yeah, I clearly outkicked my coverage on that one. Married up, and I listen to whatever she tells me to do because I am often on the losing end of any of our discussions or disagreements. It is what it is. Happy wife, happy life. I embrace it. Worked in some great cities, nationally recognized for excellence in journalism. Wow, the, my TEDx uh, talk was just one of the highlights of my professional career. I'll mention where you can find that on YouTube a little bit later if you're interested in it. And formerly a Division I football player. Left the game at, after playing at Howard University and the University of Texas, El Paso. Chased the dream for as long as I possibly could and just realized that, wow, there's a lot of good football players out there. You know, I got to college, I was like, man, I was the man in high school. Not so much out here. These guys are big, fast, and strong. I'm looking out here at the audience. Most of you guys are not old enough to remember the Eagles legend, Seth Joyner. Seth Joyner was an amazing athlete. I played with him at, at uh, University of Texas, El Paso. I couldn't believe how big, fast, and strong this man was and the fact that we had a helmet that actually fit him. His head was ginormous, okay? And when he hit you, you felt it. And so it wasn't until 
I got a chance to actually watch a professional football game on the sidelines when I was working in Denver. The Kansas City Chiefs were playing the Broncos. It was a Monday night game. Joe Montana's last great comeback that I realized I had no business playing professional football. These guys were big, fast, hostile, agile, mobile. And I was like, I came home that night, it was October 17th, 1995, my wedding anniversary. I told my wife, I'm not gonna be able to celebrate this evening. I've got sideline passes to the Monday night football game. Can we make it up tomorrow night? She actually allowed it, but I'm still paying for it. I really enjoyed the game, but it really got me over the hump. That question that you always had, man, I probably could have made it had I worked a little hard. No, I could have done a whole lot more workouts and still would have never gotten to that level. So it was a nice reality check for me, but my Division I football experience helped shape who I am as a person, taught me how to live with purpose, taught me how to never let an opportunity get away. And that's one of the great things about sports is that there are so many life lessons in it. And why I often um, talk to my kids about just being a member of a sports team. All right, let's get started here. Teachers, can you relate to me? Any Schitt's Creek fans in here? Any? Give me some claps for Schitt's Creek. David Rose, me? We're going to have a test one week from today. That one kid, who's got that one kid in their class? So we're having a test today, right? Sometimes they just can't hear, right? And you're looking at them like, I just said it. It's plain as day. I thought you guys could relate to some of these. I've got one more for you. Did you really ask if we have to write in complete sentences? Anybody made that face? I just love this kid on the memes. I'm sure some of you have actually made this face. <laughs> so, and we got one more. When students get caught and deny any wrongdoing. Principals, have you seen this face? Dog lovers in here, I'm sure you've seen this face. I thought this would get you guys going this morning, wake you guys up. The eagle has landed. How about it? How about it? Are we ready for next week? Are we ready? Four days away. 49ers coming to town. You think 49er fans are going to come? California folks? No? You don't think so? No. It, and plus, it's not safe, right? <laughs> like, like, why would they do that? Why would they risk life and limb to come to the Eagles Stadium? All right, Giants fans. I was watching the Giants when they were playing in the Yale Bowl and at Giants Stadium. And I'm old enough to remember the Pasarchik fumble and the Herm Edwards scoop and score. So I've been feeling the pain for a long time. I did not expect anybody to beat the Eagles last weekend. Just want to let you know. I'm with you guys, all right? So I should be able to safely leave the building today. So good luck this weekend. Please beat those Niners. So speak no evil. Let's talk about ways that we want to find ways to connect in a media-driven society today. You know, we hear people talk about sound bites. We hear people talk about um, the lack of communication. You know, so many of our kids right now are speaking in, uh, you know, three and four letter phrases, LOL, LMAO, ROTFL, what is all that, right? We, we see it in our writing. You know, sometimes I would look at my kid, I'm like, what is this? You have to write out the complete sentence, right? The teacher doesn't understand what this gibberish is. You have to actually say it. By the way, anybody catch the Today Show this morning? Artificial intelligence is coming into your lives. This chatbot GPT, GTP, have you guys heard about this? They're gonna be writing papers for the kids. Writing papers for the kids. Hey, shout out to all of us who graduated without Google, right? Without the Google machine. How are these kids gonna survive without the Google machine? Do they even know how to go to the library and look up a library book? Does the Dewey Decimal System still exist? I, I'm not sure. But, you know, it, it is amazing, you know, what these shortcuts and technology has done to our ability to communicate and connect with one another, right? It's just really gotten in the way. Went to a nightclub a couple years ago. A buddy of mine was in the entertainment industry, and he was you know, doing some research on providing experiences. So I called one of my older son's friends. I said, hey, can you, you know, that nightclub you were telling me about, my buddy wants to go see it. So we go to this nightclub. We get there about 12.30, nobody is there. It's like a Wednesday night. And I'm thinking to myself, where is everybody on a Wednesday night? What are you doing? What time are people actually coming here? My son's friend said, oh, just wait, it'll start to fill up soon. 1, 1.30, the crowd starts rolling in. 
Where have you people been? This is 30-somethings, 20-somethings. Where have you people been? Like, what? did you go to a club before this? They come in the club. There's no dance floor, first of all. Okay, so like, I'm like, what are we doing in here? Like, what, what am I supposed to do now? I don't see a dance floor. There's a buffet over there, which was weird. The music, <laughs> the music is pounding. I mean, it is a jammy jam, like a basement jam. And I'm thinking to myself, what is going on? I said, the music is pounding. Why is there no dance floor? There's nothing but couches and sofas. And the nice ones are over in the VIP. And I'm thinking, what, like, what, what is all the couches and sofas and these tables with these big buckets on them? Well, you buy bottles, right? And then you sit on the sofa and you take pictures of your group and send them to each other. You don't actually talk to the person that you're with, and then you wait for the bottle to come. And so a bottle shows up, and my friend orders a bottle. Yeah, we'll take a bottle of that, take a bottle of this. Young lady shows up, and she's like, how much is it? She's like, $700. $700? I said, Brock, this thing's $350 a bottle. I said, we're actually going to drink that? You're going to pay for this? He says, Mark, he's like, this, this is the going rate. He's like, it's actually not a bad price. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I haven't paid $350 for anything, much less at night in the club. And we're not even going to, because I'm not eating at the buffet here. <laughs> right? And all they did all night, I just sat there and observed and watched these young people texting each other. Right? Nobody was talking. There was no interaction except through the phone. It was all selfies and send them. Did you get it? Yeah, I got it. I was, I was amazed. And so I left there that night, got home like 3.30 in the morning. They were still partying hard when we left. I was like, nobody's got to work tomorrow. It must be a holiday. I just missed it. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, we are in so much trouble. No wonder these young people that are coming into the workforce are struggling. First of all, they're dead tired. <laughs> Second of all, they've got no idea how to communicate, how to connect. And so that's what I'm focused on today for you. How to connect, how to connect with your young people, how to connect with their parents, right? Who looks forward to those interactions, right? Parent-teacher night, oh joy. Right? Mom and dad coming in on 10 already angry about something that you haven't done. But wow, how do we turn down the volume? And how did we get here? So the way it works for these uh, television news junkets, they fly in all these reporters from around the country. You file into these beautiful hotel suites. This was at the Four Seasons in uh, in Bel Air. And so you're sitting there, in Beverly Hills rather, and so you sit down across from the star and you fire off questions, right? They hear the same questions all day long. They're sitting in there for like eight, nine hours, right? So when you come in, you know, a lot of times the stars just kind of look at you like, oh my gosh, who are, you? who are you and where are you from, right? And they're not interested in you at all. Just give me the questions and get out of here, okay? Will Smith, Will Smith, before we get to the slap you around the world jokes, Will Smith gets up, he greets me. He's like, Mark Hayes from Atlanta, how you doing, sir? Gives me a hug and a pound. I'm like, oh my God, does Will know me? Are me and Will boys? Like, did I not know this? He shakes my hand, he asks how I'm doing. He gives me a, a quick Atlanta story. And I'm like, oh my God, me and Will are gonna be hanging out. This is great. Will loves me. Like, Will is my dude. I can't wait to get home to tell everybody. Me and Will Smith are homies. So he sits down. I ask him about Charlie Mack, one of his rap songs that he had done years ago. Charlie Mack, first out the limo. I'm like, where's Charlie Mack? Is he here? You know, am I going get, to get to meet Charlie Mack? He's like, Charlie's still first out the limo. And he smiles. He's got this great big energy about him. And all he does is proceed to connect right, and convince me about how excited he is about this project, how passionate he is about this project, why everybody needs to go see it. And I'm thinking to myself, everybody better go see this movie. And if I have anything to do with it, everyone in Atlanta will definitely see it. 
So all he does is focus on the connection, the communication. His stories are amazing. If you follow him on social media, you watch him tell a story, you're like hanging on the edge of your seat, just waiting. Like, wow, Will, this story is absolutely amazing. He makes memorable moments for you while he's creating these connections. And then you're, do that, I'm sorry. And then you're like, oh my goodness, this guy has just convinced me, first of all, that we're best friends. Second of all, that I've got to give him my cell phone number so he can reach me if he needs me. You know, and third of all, I've got to clear my schedule for all the big events coming up that I'm going to be going to with him. Right? So I need that calendar right away, Will. I need your people to get in touch with my people. Right? Because that's the kind of atmosphere he's created. But the one thing that he does that separated him from so many others, George Clooney was great at this too. He listened and he understood what you were, say, what you were saying. And he would even repeat it back to you. He's like, Mark, so what I hear you saying is that you really enjoyed my movie. You really enjoyed I Am Legend. So I know for a fact that he heard me. He heard my question. And it took our connection to an even higher level because Will was actually listening to me. Like I wanted to go and run up and down the streets of Rodeo Drive and tell people, Will Smith actually listened to me. He heard all my questions. He heard everything I said to him. He even told me how Charlie Mack first out the limo was doing. And so it made me excited about his project. He'd accomplished his goal. In five minutes, in five minutes, I get up out of the chair at the end of our interview. He gives me a pound. He gives me a hug. He says, hey, you want to grab a picture? I snap a picture for proof that we're homies and that we'll see each other again outside of a movie junket. And he's done what he set out to do. I went back to Atlanta to scream from the rooftops how amazing this movie was. Right? So we wonder, I wondered, like this Will Smith has never, right, had issues in the public except for the issues that he's had on social media and the toxic environment that surrounded his relationship. So how did we get to that night in Hollywood where Will was pushed to the limit? You know, Will was on edge. What drove him there? That was the first thing I thought when I saw what had happened. How did he get to the edge where he had to go up on stage in front of the world and physically harm someone else, right? A man who was so careful, so crafty about creating an image that would sell. Remember Big Willie Summers? I mean, there was Men in Black, there was Independence Day. We used to wait for the Will Smith Summer blockbuster, right? That was were masterfully orchestrated, right? How does someone behind that kind of brand get pushed to this level? Right? Well, his wife, of course, is doing her red table talks, talking about these entanglements and all the craziness. And then people are opining on it like they do on Twitter. Right? Because you can say anything you want on Twitter, by the way. I don't know if you guys knew that. They do it on the gram. And he sees all this. Right? His people see all this. Because he's got Google alerts. So every time his name appears in an article, it pops up. His people see it and they send it to him. So he's constantly barraged. And that's what social media does. Constantly sending you the toxic content that pushes you to the point of no return. Right? So the first thing I thought was how did we get here? And obviously something pushed him to that point because obviously he was embarrassed by the things that people share on social media. You know, my wife says, I'm sure you're gonna go in there this morning and knock them dead because you're gonna share everything. I said, that's what I do, I'm an oversharer. When I was on television in Atlanta, people would say, hey Mark, where you headed to this weekend? I know you got a hockey tournament you're going to. My wife was like, people know when you're going out of town because you can't keep your mouth shut. They know what you had for dinner last night. They know that our chocolate lab climbed up on the, 
on the island in the kitchen and ate the pumpkin pie. Stop sharing so much. But that's what people do on social media. They just share blindly. And they overshare. And then, and then, they constantly feel like they have to be there. Because they don't want to miss anything. <clears throat> All right. Six studies to prove the apocalypse is near. I'm sure you already knew this. But the negative effects of social media, obviously so many of them, right? And it's difficult for us to grasp. But aggression and bullying, I know you guys are seeing it, right? The kids can't get away from it. Even adults are dealing with it. Aggressive behavior, bullying on social media. It happens all the time, all day, every day, right? And why? Because it's profitable. It's profitable. These companies are making millions and millions, of, billions of dollars, right? Because we can't get enough and we've got that, that FOMO, that fear of missing out. And so they continuously feed us toxic content that we don't want to miss for whatever reason. It's kind of like television news, right? We, there have been studies where we tried to do good news stories. Good news broadcasts have failed miserably over the years. Nobody has a good news show. Nobody says an amazing story coming up this evening, and it's a very happy one. Hope you'll tune in. We don't do that in TV news because folks don't want to see it. They'd rather watch the train wreck with one eye open than hear a good news story. The research shows it. Right? That's just human nature. It is who we are. It's how we're made up. So it sparks superficial conversation, right? There's a loss of reality and perception, especially for young people. They've got no context. They've got no age and experience on them. And so they struggle with it, trying to figure it out. Right? And what does that do? It normalizes some of this behavior that they see. And now that's how they operate. They feel like it's normal, right? Because all the content they see is about constant confrontation, right? And when I was in television news, it was all about the confrontation. That's what people want to see. What do you see in the supermarket these days now? Constant confrontation. You know, people will run their basket into you if you're not moving fast enough. Like, even in the South, even in Georgia, I was like, where's the Southern hospitality here? You just rammed into me with your basket. All right? Oh, you weren't moving fast enough. Really? In the South? In Atlanta? You folks are having full-blown conversations at the cash register. I'm from New York. Get in there, pay for your groceries, and get out. What are you talking about here on the line? We'll talk later. All right? It's constant confrontation. Road rage. I've never seen so much road rage. Why are people so angry? Right? You drive past people, they've got their head down looking at their phone. It is constant. It is constant confrontation. And the toxic nature of it all is what these companies feed off of. And they target our young people especially. Then they target us through our behaviors and our patterns and the places that we go, the things we search for, the things we watch. Anybody got YouTube television? YouTube TV? Ah, yep, there's one back in the corner. Google knows everything you watch. <laughs> your DVR, all your shows, and they're feeding you stuff based on your viewing habits. When I turn on my YouTube, my YouTube TV and I look up at the top there, all the shows there, you know, recommending for me, it's all based on what I've saved, what I've added to my library, what they think I might be interested in. So I can get a continuous flow of that toxic content. And so what is it doing? What is it doing to us as a society? Where is it taking us? You know, the Kardashians talk about <laughs> revealing a little bit too much, right? They've become superstars, billionaires, off of oversharing, I would argue. I mean, think about some of the storylines on Keeping Up with the Kardashians, right? Are they not sensational? And have they not been on forever? We've watched these three generations of Kardashians grow up. 
We've watched Bruce go through his thing or Caitlin. Right? How many times has Kim been married? <laughs> I mean, wow, who broadcasts their entire marriage <laughs> on a reality show? What was it, 76 Days with Chris Humphrey? I mean, it was in and out. And they were teasing it on the show. Is it doomsday for Kim and Chris? Tune in. Wednesday night at 9. And we watched. And we watched. And we watched. You know, and now they got another season. And another season. Because we can't get enough. But this is the, the, the relationships that we see on reality TV. They can't be based in reality. So what happens? We normalize that behavior, especially our young people. Now, you and I might know better. Now, you and I know we don't want to be in these kinds of relationships. You and I look at the communication between the people in these relationships, and we think, oh, my God, how are they putting up with that? Like, at what point are you leaving? Oh, it's reality TV, but it's not so real. Yes, it's entertainment. The thing about reality TV is it's highly profitable and it's cheap. Anybody remember that season of Friends when all the cast members banded together and got a million dollars per episode? You don't have to worry about that with Real Housewives. You don't have to worry about that with Jersey Shore because they'll take 100000 and then go to a bunch of uh, nightclubs up and down the Jersey and, and uh, the Jersey Shore and get appearance fees and make money and do it for the gram and become influencers. And who are they influencing? They're influencing our young people. Did I do that? They're influencing our young people, right? Giving them all these different kinds of norms and, and kinds of behaviors that we're not quite sure our kids understand, right? So what is happening, right? How does it manifest itself, right? Think about the kinds of relationships our kids are in, young people are in. You know, if this is their model, how frightening is that? Because they, they, they know what they see, they know what they see. You know, we know the fabric and fight with the family has broken down over the years, right? We don't eat dinner like we used to together because we're too busy. We got this activity, we got that activity, we got to go here, we got to be there. So we don't even have an opportunity to talk about what's going on in their lives, to connect, to find out where they are, what they need, right? What they're, what they're learning so we can offer some content. And then again, it continues to grow and manifest. And they're fed a steady diet. So I apologize for doing my part in reality TV. I don't know if you recognize these ladies. This is from season one of The Real Housewives of Atlanta, the night before the auction episode, in which I starred as the auctioneer. I apologize sincerely, but wow, was it interesting to watch, right? Go back to season one, by the way, streaming on Hulu, you can just back. <laughs> I don't get any residuals. But we had this auction set up. One of the prizes was a $10,000 trip in a private jet courtside uh, seats to a Cleveland Cavaliers game and lunch with LeBron. Now, the party was promoted on the broadcast news this particular morning, and then there were flyers passed out in the local mall. <laughs> so most of the people in attendance got a flyer from the mall and showed up at the Sean Stell's house. Now, I'm not quite sure which mall it was. But there was nobody bidding on a $10,000 private plane package for the ball game at courtside seats. And so, when I'm watching the show, when an episode actually aired, I heard crickets. And I'm like, I didn't hear those crickets when we were filming this. 
but it made for a great storyline. You know, because of the way it all turned out. Because of the way it looked. And so they loved the dramatic effect that this thing was blowing up in real time. Nobody was bidding on anything. And it just turned into a complete disaster. So much so, you know, the host ran out of the room, the main room, ran into a bedroom, hid, right? The, step, the folks are looking for her, can't find her. My wife is running around like, this house is beautiful. <laughs> Please stop being a doctor. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I couldn't do this. Thanks, sir. I couldn't do this. You know, I was a nervous, I was nervous enough just saying, who will bid? Who will give me $10,000 for this amazing package? Of course, it was no one. But it was all about the dramatic effect because it was going to sell, right? Because they, all they were doing was creating conflict. And then, of course, later on in the show, the other ladies would talk about what a disaster it was. And now we get ready for the confrontation. Why were you talking about my event, girl? I don't see you having one. Are you mad because my house is more beautiful than yours? Right? And so this is what we consume. This is how simple it's become. And again, it makes a ton of money. They're still on. They're still doing seasons. Right? So we talk about the strength of the influence. Right? We talk about what all this toxic content is doing to us as a society. And it's taken away our ability to have rational conversations. Because now we've normalized the fact that we should be confronting everyone. I mean, when the teacher calls home and wants to let a parent know that their child is struggling, the parent is automatically on the defense. Why are you picking on my kid? I'm calling because I'd like to help your child, and I'd like your partnership. Well, he says you're picking on him. Right? We're, in the, we're on the defense, and now we're backpedaling, trying to figure out why. Is someone accusing me of picking on their child when all I'm doing is calling to see if we can be partners in helping getting your child where you'd like them to be. So immediately the volume is raised. Right? The tone and tenor is way out of whack for a conversation that began with I'd like to help. I mean, it is just a sign of the time. Right? It is a sign of the times. I don't know anyone that doesn't have a Facebook account. I don't know anyone that's not on the gram. Right? I don't have a TikTok, but I don't know anyone that doesn't have a TikTok. <laughs> I mean, we're all there. We're a captive audience, and the companies know it. And the strength of the influence is what is eroding our values and keeping us normalizing behavior that is abnormal. But some people are doing something about it. I shared this yesterday with some of the folks that I met with. The biggest school district in Seattle, in Washington State, is actually taking some action, right? Because of the adverse effects. They're causing, the young people want to cause themselves harm, right? They know this. They have all the research because they have an inability to judge reality and discern what's real and what's not. Right? You and I can watch a lot of these reality shows and tell what's real and what's not. Our young people have a very difficult time with that. Loss of key relationships, right? You notice a lot of kids are isolating themselves, right? especially after the pandemic. So what's the, what's the ripple effect? Is that these school systems are having to drain on resources. They need more caseworkers, more mental health professionals, more nurses because kids might try to harm themselves during the day, right? They're seeing it firsthand, just like you are. Right now, a kid doesn't say, I just saw this video of, and somebody's bullying me on my phone or on my gram. 
But now they're in a fight because they're upset about something they saw. Or maybe it's as simple as a young lady that's sitting in class with her head down because she didn't get enough likes on a photo, a photo she posted. Right? But you don't know what's wrong. You don't know if she's tired from track practice yesterday. You don't know what it is. I mean, the average child is spending an hour and a half a day on social media alone. An hour and a half. Think about how much time that adds up to over the week, over the month, over the year. It's a lot of wasted time. And it's a lot of toxic energy going into the minds of young people. You know, the male brain doesn't fully develop until they're 25, 26 years old. Think about how young men are dealing with this, right? How they're trying to figure out how to deal with women, right? How to be involved in relationships that don't look like what they see on Jersey Shore. I'm picking on Jersey Shore. I used to go to the shore. I never danced on the tables, though. <laughs> But this is what we're dealing with. This is our new reality today. And, you know, these, these tech companies don't care because it's all for profit. You know, 50,000 students directly impacted. Think about that number. Is your district that big? You got about 40,000 here in, in, your, in the district wide? Much smaller? 6,500. 60, 6, okay. Okay, imagine you know, nine times that number being impacted. And then they're moving forward to college, into our society, into the work world, struggling with these same issues that they've never gotten any assistance with, right? And that's why my goal is to help parents communicate, to understand what kids are going through so that they can help them have context and stay connected with them and understand what they need. If you're not having conversations with your child, you don't know what they need. You don't know how to help them. You don't know how to support them. It might be something as simple as just giving them some advice about alcohol or drugs. Because you see everything. There is nothing that's out of bounds on social media. So these kids are seeing this. They got no context. And oftentimes they don't know where to turn for help. You know, but communities are built on respect and rapport. And when we have this toxic culture that is kind of existing on, on the lower levels of our psyche, it's manifesting itself in our communities, right? And this is a gorgeous community. I raised my kids in, in a community very similar to this. Great schools, great neighborhoods, great neighbors, great people, right? Just because I wanted them to understand what success look like, what it takes to be successful. I wanted them around people like you, people who actually care about children. You guys may find this hard to believe, but there are some school systems that can't find people like you. It is very difficult. For 40 years, 45 years, my dad worked with wards of the court from the five boroughs in New York City in an institutional setting, trying to teach in the mid-80s, he made me come to work with him. You know what was happening in the mid-80s? The crack babies were coming. And you couldn't do anything with them. It's basically an exercise in futility. The families were broken. They had nowhere to go. They were basically holding them until the state could get them. That was a different era and a different kind of problem, but much the same. Because we're seeing the fracturing of the family. And it's happening in public schools all over the country. Now we've got the opioid ep epidemic, which no one can get away from. You know, couple that with toxic social media and other societal pressures. Busy parents, bless you, running around, trying to keep food on the table, trying to keep a roof over everyone's head, trying to recover from a pandemic. Right? And with nowhere to turn for help. So it continues and it continues to fester. But, you know, we've got to get back to creating those environments for understanding. Understanding what people are going through. Understanding where they're coming from. Understanding their journey. And the only way to get to know people is to have conversations with them. Is to talk to them. 
right, to create an environment of understanding and trust. Right? Because you can't, you can't, you can, as, as a parent, right, I tried to rule with fear. I was the dictator in our home. What I say goes, it's a dictatorship. I might hear you out if I feel like it. But once I say it, that's it. That's the law. And that was the wrong approach. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. But we've got to create that environment of understanding. We've got to get back to being able to hear each other, to listen to one another, and to respect one another's feelings. And that word respect goes a long way. We just don't use it a lot anymore. When I talk about communities and community strength, it's built on families, built on amazing families like mine. I told you about my incredible wife, just an amazing human being, super strong, grew up in a housing project right outside New York City, I mean, right in, in, uh, in Queens, New York. Beautiful woman, met her in 1987, been in love with her ever since. She's the best thing going in our family. She keeps us all together. She's the glue. She didn't play either. By the way, I would go up to the high school and tell and warn folks, I'd say, look, you folks want to deal with me because if Mrs. Hayes has to come up here, it's not going to be pretty. All right, so let's get this done. You guys don't want to see Mrs. Hayes, okay? Not the prosecutor anyway. She's going to ask you a whole lot of questions you can't answer. I know. It happens to me all the time. But strong communities are built on strong families. And so it's, it's important that we understand the family structure because no family is immune, right? We've got to hear what our kids are saying. This is my oldest son in the Hooch jersey there. That's my oldest son, Kenny, man. Just an amazing, photogenic, affable young man. Uh, that picture on the right is at Howard University at graduation. And um, what an amazing day. We were so proud of him. Went to Howard University, played football, got a scholarship there. Didn't really want to work at it, though. He could ball, but he wasn't willing to do the extra work. In his five years at Howard University, he is, of course, known for not having missed one single party that was thrown in D.C. He caught them all. He caught them all. Now, he would have caught more balls had he been in the weight room and doing what he was supposed to do to become a better football player, but he was more interested in the street life and in the party life, right? And as a parent, you can only pray and hope. You know, because every school isn't right for every kid. Howard University was definitely not the place for him. And we learned that later. But as we continued to try to support him, to try to follow him, to try to guide him, give him, you know, just lessons on life from our experiences, he rebelled, wanted to do it his way, thought he knew everything, right? And in the meantime, on social media, he was creating an entirely an entirely unknown alternate persona. He had two Facebook pages, one for the streets and one for the family, All right? Bible verses and pictures of the family, All right? Quotes on love. And then on the other Facebook page, all about the gang life, all about the music all about the streets, all about what's happening in the A. Now, you grew up in Alpharetta, okay? That's the only A you know. You didn't grow up in Atlanta. You didn't grow up on the south side of Atlanta. You didn't grow up like that, so why are you creating that persona? But he wrote it as far as he could, and that became his new reality until we got to this. As a full-blown gang member, he was involved in a home invasion in Johns Creek, Georgia, which is right outside the city of Atlanta. Why is Johns Creek important? Because that's the city my wife happened to be the former prosecutor in. So the very people that she worked side by side with were tasked with bringing him to justice. The very people that she had so much respect for and enjoyed going to work with side by side each and every day as a member of the law enforcement community, had to go find her son and bring him in. It was the worst day of our lives, August 17, 2016. 
a day I'll never forget. The day I got this text to this newspaper article, it was from a good friend of his, and I texted him back. I'm like, why are you sending me this? I don't recognize these guys. Who are they? So Mr. Hayes looked closer. I can't believe he did this. And then it hit me. I broke out in a sweat. I was mortified. I was beyond saddened. And then I started praying because I didn't know what was happening. We were in Cincinnati at the time. This was in Atlanta. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I'd ever see him again on the street as a free man. Once I read the article, I was like, oh, my God, I, we may never see him again. And thank goodness the people that happened to be home when they ran in this house were not seriously injured. Physically, emotionally, I pray for them every day because I can't imagine living in a home where I don't feel safe. I can't imagine not being comfortable in my home that I've worked so hard for. And then having two individuals like this bust into my house and shatter my sense of security. This is not how he was raised. This is not what he was taught. But when he listened to the music, a college teammate told me he was in a trance. It was like the music moved him. He believed it. He believed some of these lyrics. It became part of his persona. It became part of who he is. And then he created this entirely corrupt alter ego. This is my other son. And this is why I remind you that there's always hope. Because I figured it out with him. I realized that our older son had pushed us away and I had to do it differently so that he would not. He currently plays professional ice hockey in the East Coast Hockey League. But he listened to us. He heard us. He understood the importance of communication. When he wanted to take his own life because he felt so guilty about what had happened with his brother and he watched the whole thing transpire on social media and never said anything to mom and dad, he wanted to take his own life. I happened to FaceTime him one gloomy Tuesday afternoon in Bangor, May. Uh, you know in the wintertime in Bangor, you don't see a lot of sun. So, a lot of gray. Right. I said, what are you doing? And I'm sitting here watching 13 Reasons Why. Why are you watching that? No, I'm not sure if I want to be here anymore. Okay. Hang up. I'll call you right back. Called the coach. I said, coach, get him into counseling by tomorrow, or I'll be on a plane up there by Thursday, and he's coming home with me, and I'll make sure he gets the help he needs. Those are your two choices. He said, Mark, I'll take care of it. He was in counseling that Wednesday and back fighting the right to ship on Thursday. With our support, with our help, with our guidance as a team. And I said, I need you to be mentally strong. I need you to be tough because you're throwing away everything you've worked for because of what somebody else has done. That's your brother. I know you love him. I know you want him to, to, to have the best. He made some decisions. And none of us should feel guilty because we've done nothing but give him an opportunity to succeed. He had everything he needed to be successful in some of the things he wanted. But he made some choices that he now has to live with. And we are feeling it in the ripple effect. There are none of us that aren't hurting. His kids, my mother, myself. I have days that I don't want to get up and don't get out of bed but I know that's not helping anyone, especially him. I know that's not helping him, right? Realize his goals. Never played another game for the University of Maine. He developed a plan, transferred to University of Alaska, played 40 games up there, and at the end of that season, signed his pro contract because he kept his eyes on the prize, got his degree, and got back on track. Now I have, to, I, have to, I have to beg him to post to social media. I'm like, you got to post on social media. You got to piggyback off the Gladiator's brand. You got 20,000, you know, uh, Gladiator followers. You know, use them to follow them. To, and so they'll follow you and you can promote your business. They're like, nah, dad, I'm good. I'm not posting. I'm not doing it. That's fine. That's fine. So... You know, 
we see how this stuff manifests itself. Right? And you guys are dealing with it on a regular basis. You got a class full of kids, and, you're, and you never know which one is struggling. You never know who's at that point when they get right to the edge and they need your help or they need a parent's guidance. And that's the struggle. So let's talk about some ways that we can improve our relationships with the people we love, the people we work with in our community. How do we better our community through the master, through mastering the art of communication? No, first of all, we have to understand the process, right? And it's much more complicated than we like to think because, again, through the erosion of our societal values and our societal norms, we've begun to talk at each other and not to each other, right? We've forgotten how the art of communication works. Our verbal messages, our tone and tenor, right? Sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it, right? The wrong turn, tone and tenor sends the wrong message, right? So we have to be there and present and have clarity and understand what we're saying. When we coach a team, right? Bill Belichick, right? We see him on the podium. He's a horrible communicator, right? But when he was winning, right, there was no room for error. His teams knew exactly what he wanted them to do. And they carried out his direction to the letter. Coach Sirianni, same thing. A little bit better communicator at the podium, though. Right? There's no ambiguity. Communication is the key to success. Nonverbal messages. Your body language speaks volumes. People can tell how you feel just by looking at how you're sitting in your chair. Just by the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you approach a conversation, right? Are you present? Are you giving me eye contact? Are you giving me a nice firm handshake? Although I can't do it these days with the hand. Excuse me. Right? There's a way to communicate. There's a way to let people know the lights are on. We went to um, a prep school visit when my son was playing hockey up in the Northeast there in New Hampshire, and the coach met my son, and he said, Mark, you know what? I knew I wanted to coach your son when he gave me a fir firm handshake, looked me in the eye and said, hello, Coach Wright, how you doing today? And I knew the lights were on with this kid. He said, the other four kids that were with you guys that day, he's like, they were all over the place. He was like, they were just trying to figure out when we got to eat. <laughs> you know, your kid was here. He was present. He was in the moment, right? There has never been a time to be more in the moment than right now. And of course, listening, hearing what people are saying, right? Actively listening to understand. Because awareness is the key to understanding, right? And you have to listen to understand. Like Will Smith, remember I said he would repeat back what I said. So I know that he heard me, right? It's a simple little tool that will help these kids and these parents know that you are hearing them, right? You've connected with them. There's understanding now. I got to get a better clicker. So, another quick tool. We talked about this yesterday. E plus R equals O. Stuff happens, right? Events happen. Stuff goes wrong, right? How do you respond? How do you react? What is your response going to be that will determine the O, the outcome? Right? When stuff happens to you, you respond one particular way, and you don't like the outcome, change your R. Change your response when stuff happens because we've got no, no power, no control over the things that happen, right? But we have all the control and all the power in the R, in the response. So when kids come in the classroom and they're all unruly, you know, on a particular Friday because you know, it's, it's Friday before vacation, and you can't get them settled down, right? That's the event. What's your response? What's your response? Are you going to pile on and make it a more, 
you know, volatile situation? Or are you going to figure out a way to bring calm to the situation, right? To get everybody focused for another 48-minute class until we can get them to vacation, right? And then you can get the outcome that you want. Be able to share the lesson that's in your lesson plan for that particular day. Your power is in the response. And that's something you guys are definitely going to want to remember and try to focus on as you go forward. I live my life by this rule. Back in August, I was injured in a medical mishap, which partially paralyzed my right side. I basically lost the use of my right hand. And my response was, okay, I got to figure out a way to work. Right? Did I mention my wife was from Queens and I can't sit home and do nothing? Right? I had to respond in a way that keeps me productive. All right, my wife bought a home gym. She's like, help me put this together. I was like, I can't. Yes, you can. Okay. <laughs> right? It's the response. I could have sat home and played victim, canceled all my engagements, not gone anywhere, not gone to rehab. Can't respond that way. Can't be productive. Can't accomplish the things I need to accomplish. Right? Your power lies in the response to get the outcome you want. Not getting the outcome you want, change your R. And feedback, of course. Feedback matters. Feedback is everywhere. You guys are aware of that. I know we hate reviews, right? We hate to have to sit and talk with our superiors. But that's not the only time we get feedback. Feedback is all around us. Right? We get feedback from our students. Right? We get feedback from our community. We get feedback from our team. Feedback is everywhere. Utilize it. Learn from it. See how it can make you better and embrace it. You know, so many of us look at feedback as something critical, something to shy away from. Right, because it makes us take a good hard look at ourselves and maybe points out some of our inefficiencies or deficiencies. Right? We don't like to think of ourselves as having those. But in this day and age, we've got to continue to get better because we've got to keep up with what's happening and the societal changes, just like our ability to communicate. Utilize feedback as often as possible and in the best way possible and look at it as an opportunity to be positive. Right? And that's how you know when you're on the right track. Right? That's how you know when, you're, when your students are responding to you and you look at your class and say, oh my gosh, my guys have got it. My kids have got it. That is a form of feedback. Right? Their response to your efforts. Right? Because I know how hard you guys work. You know, and, and your reward, your payoff is to see these successful kids and to see these kids do well. So look for opportunities to obtain feedback. Now, last but not least, we're going to finish on a high note. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but the best Philly cheesesteaks come from Atlanta? Who agrees? Anyone? No? You guys know a little thing or two about cheesesteaks here? Just a little bit, huh? It's Philly, right? You're like, Mr. Hayes, where'd you come up with that preposterous idea? Right, because it doesn't make any sense. It's not factual. We barbecue in Atlanta. You don't have any Philly cheesesteaks down there. You got pork barbecue. You got brisket, right? We're experts at barbecue, not cheesesteaks. But don't criticize me. Don't attack me. Attack the idea, right, the gall that someone would come up with an idea that says there are Philly cheesesteaks in Atlanta and oh, by the way, they're better than the ones in Philly. But a lot of times in our society now, especially when you look at our political discourse, we're attacking people, not ideas. We, we're, we're not criticizing the idea itself. Oh, that person thinks this way, so I don't like them. Let's focus on the ideas as opposed to trying to tear someone down. Let's lift each other up. Because everywhere I go, I say the same thing. We are more alike than not. There is common ground with each of us. Right? 
I mentioned my son went to the University of Maine and automatically I've got a friend. Right? That's an automatic connection. Find common ground. And I'll leave you with this one last story. I'm going to wrap up, get you guys out of here. But it, it, it's funny. I had to put, it's not funny. May he rest in peace. I had to put my dog down last February. And it was so unexpected. He was 13. He was absolutely adorable. Roscoe Jenkins was his name. Anybody see the movie? Welcome home, Roscoe Jenkins. That's where he got his name. We had to put him down. And when we got his ashes back um, from the uh, pet crematorium, it was in such a beautiful package. It's a beautiful box with a card with his paw print and a flower, to, uh, some seeds to plant in his memory. And oh my God, me and my wife started bawling again. And then we had to run outside and show our neighbors. Her, look, look at this amazing box, it's Roscoe. My, my neighbor was not a dog lover. I'm like, Dean, look at this. I can't believe they sent me. This is so nice. I didn't even know people did this kind of thing. They care about Roscoe. Right? He says, oh, let me see that card. He looks at the card. He says, yeah, Kyle did that. I said, Kyle? Yeah, Kyle, two doors down. My next door neighbor was the pet crematorium guy. I've been living next to you for five years, Kyle. I didn't even know what you did. So my wife and I run over there with the box, and we're like, Kyle, are you home? Thank you, thank you, thank you. They're like, what is going on? I said, my name is Mark. I live two doors down. And I just wanted to thank you for this amazing box, for this amazing tribute to Roscoe. And we created a connection. Now we're buds. Right? Find common ground. Share your story. You never know who it might motivate. Don't be afraid to communicate. You know, we're so afraid to open up and share, but you never know who you might move, what life you might save just by sharing, just by talking to people. My superpower is being able to talk to anyone, anywhere, anytime about anything, and I embrace it, and my life is richer for it. And I want yours to be just as rich. Folks, I got to tell you, I have enjoyed being here with you these last two days. You are an absolutely amazing community. I wish you continued success. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be around all morning. Um, and are we going to take some questions now or do we want to move on? Okay, you guys got some questions? Fire away. I'm an open book. Let me have it. All right. Anything but the cheesesteak thing. <laughs> no, we're all good. No questions? Yes. Right. So the question was, how do we um, kind of turn down the level on things and content that is meant to get us excited, meant to move us in the negative direction? And again, you know, I promote conversation constantly, right? It starts with understanding where that content is coming from and why they're embracing it, right? And then the conversation is about, well, what about this moves you? And then we move to why, in fact, you know, would you subscribe to this? And then once you have an understanding of why they're following that individual, then you can begin to address, you know, their need to consume that kind of content, right? A great example is, um, you know, one of the, the, the tricks that I use with my, my hockey player to get him talking is I'll sneak down when he's working out and listen to the music that he's listening to and then ask him about the artists. And so there was this particular, it was a catchy pop, man, I meant to look up, I'm gonna look up that song. It was a catchy pop song that these rappers in Florida took and put the lyrics to it about this gang war that was going on in Jacksonville. And it was a really catchy tune, and I'm listening to the song, like, I like this. I'm like, oh my God, are they talking about killing people? Is that what's happening here? So I asked my son, I was like, what, you know, what's the story with this, this, this particular song? 
And he's like, oh, dad, they got a whole rap war going on down in, in, in Jacksonville. The guys that they're singing about are making songs in response to this one. And this one says he did this to this one. He said, but you know, these guys aren't going to be around long. They're actually admitting to their crimes on the song and in the video. But we had a great conversation about it because I got to understand. He said, yeah, you know, it's just a good song. He's like, I don't actually believe that these guys are running around. They're actually making too much money to be running around doing stupid stuff, right? Why would they jeopardize the money that they're making, you know, when it's so easy for them to get the money? So the conversation led me to understand that he had it in perspective, right? He wasn't consuming it like my older son. You know, now my older son would listen to that and think, wow, these guys are real. I can, I can do this too. I can emulate these guys. Right? Because he believed it. He believed it. But my son has an eclectic taste. My, my hockey player has an eclectic taste. Listen to country music. You know, he was listening to an artist one time and we got to talking about country music. I said, I didn't know you were a country music fan. So, yeah, we went to see um, so-and-so when he was, you know, at Wild Bill's. You should have seen the crowd. crowd was going crazy. It loved him. You know, so he has a wide ranging variety of interests. But, you know, it's all based on communication, right? Just like when he was watching 13 Reasons Why. I needed to know why you're watching that. And he told me because he wasn't quite sure if he wanted to be here anymore because he felt like what he saw transpire, he was partially to blame. And I had to assure him that he was not. So when you have that conversation, it opens up the door for you to find solutions, right? And I don't know, he may have been ready to take his, I don't know if he was. He may well have been ready, but I didn't want to find out. I didn't want to find out. Great question though, thank you so much for that. Any others? I don't know if you guys followed the story of Katie Meyer, the Stanford goalie. Um, she was a goalie on the women's soccer team, had won a national championship there, had everything to live for. Her parents went on the Today Show absolutely heartbroken, grief-stricken. Her mother was wearing uh, Katie's sweatshirt because she just wanted to smell Katie. You know, and if you can imagine the, the, the grief that a parent goes through bearing a child, you, you know, you can almost begin to relate. But, you know, it is, it is incredibly difficult for um, a parent to lose a child and then move on. And one of the things she said in the Today Show interview was that we wished we had known what was going on. Now they filed a lawsuit against the university. That was the latest, but I think it was back in November because the, the university was threatening disciplinary action. These, she must have thought she might have been expelled or kicked off the soccer team. And that was the incident that triggered her wanting to take her own life and being successful at it. And so now her parents have fired back with a lawsuit. They have also started a nonprofit organization to try to get administrators in universities and colleges to open up and provide an avenue for kids who feel like they don't have any place to go. They just want to start a conversation. University of Virginia, the three young men that were gunned down there, the alleged gunman's dad went on network news saying, yeah, my son called me, said he was being bullied, said things weren't right, said he didn't feel right. And I didn't talk to him again for another month. What? What do you mean? So, so you mean these, these people's lives could have been saved had you, dad, taken some action? Had you heard what he said? Like, I was furious. I'm like, like, how does a dad hear that? How does someone hear that and not run down the campus to check on their child? Look, I know everybody just can't break away from work, but Saturday was coming. Right? Last time I checked, there were no seven-day work weeks. Right? In that month, you had at least a day to get down to Charlottesville to find out what's going on with your child. So I see it over and over again throughout the course of my television career. 
A simple conversation, you know, could have saved us from disaster. You know, but it's not so simple when we think about it, the energy it takes. Like the stuff I'm talking about sounds easy. The concepts are easily understood, but they require some work. They require some work. They require the ability to want to get better in the personal development space. That's why companies are spending so much money on personal development and on communication and on understanding and awareness. One of my corporate clients brings me in to talk about cultural awareness. How can I become more aware and understanding in an industry where that's not fostered? Because everybody that I work with looks like me. Right? And then we're surprised when we can't retain culturally diverse talent. But what can you do? How can I, how can I understand the African American experience? How can I understand the Asian American experience? Right? You can do a little research. You can do a little work. Go sit in a black church. Go sit in an Asian church. Right? Immerse yourself in the cultures. My parents wanted me to be aware of, of our culture, who I was, where we came from. So every Saturday morning, my mom would throw me in the car. We'd drive down to Harlem, and I would take art lessons. And then we would go to the different businesses and the different classes that were being held in Harlem. And we'd spend the day in Harlem just learning about the different cultural activities that have um, impacted the African-American experience. Every Martin Luther King Day, my parents would send me to school with their Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. photo album. And I would ask the teacher if I could do a little presentation before class started. That's when I began my public speaking career. But it helped me get comfortable in front of people. It helped me get comfortable being around people who didn't look like me. We had very few African Americans in the community that I grew up in. We had, uh, I think we had 12 black kids in my senior class. But it made me comfortable. I felt like I could go anywhere and talk about anything at any time because I've been doing it since I was a first grader. And it didn't intimidate me and I wasn't afraid. Another example was understanding um, the grievance of the white male during the 2015, 2016 election campaign. I really, I, I just didn't get it. You know, I didn't, I didn't really understand the Rust Belt, what was taking place there, um, the folks who had been left behind. And J.D. Vance had written the book, The Hillbilly Elegy. I saw the interview on the Today Show one morning. I ordered it, read the book, watched the movie, and then I started to grasp, okay, now it makes sense to me where this is coming from. And it helped me have some understanding because it, I mean, it took place in a town, one town over from where I was living in, in uh, Westchester, Ohio. And so then I started to understand, okay, now I see why people are upset. Now I see where this grievance is coming from and, and what is driving it. And I felt I needed that clarity and that understanding and able to do my job as a broadcaster and helping people um, understand the stories that I'm writing. I didn't, I didn't, I never wanted the stories that I told to be just words because I felt like the people that, that did interviews with me trusted me with their story. And to me, that was very important. I didn't want to betray that trust because I could get people to share things on television that I'm shocked that they would share. And that was, that was my secret to maintaining a 30-year a career in the business because I cared about people and I cared about what they had to say. Anything else? Yes. Yesterday? It was a very similar message, right? I talked about the, the, the need to let mom and dad in was one of the things that we talked about. Right? The need to be in the moment. The need to understand that all influences are not good influences. 
right? The fact that they are influencers, right, on their younger siblings. You know, this story of, of my two sons is a great example about the responsibility that comes along with being an athlete, either on a college football team or in a community like this. People look up to you because you're willing to go out there and do the hard work and the sacrifice, right? You have a special place in this community when you compete for your school. And so I wanted them to understand that no matter what you're doing, people are watching. Somebody is watching. And you're having an influence on them. What do you want that influence to be? Right? And then the fact that your relationship with mom and dad. First of all, they're genetically predisposed to love you. Right? <laughs> they're not going to give you bad advice. And I wanted them to understand it's okay to have a relationship with mom and dad. It's okay to go to them when you're not quite sure. They're going to help you. And if you just use your words and take your time and explain to them that you need to be heard. You know, a lot of us don't want to take the time. So I just tried to let them know and give them the green light. It's okay to share with mom and dad. You know, 80% of parents feel like they're being shut out of their kids' lives because their kids don't want to talk to them. 80%. That's 8 out of 10. I mean, we've got to change that. We've, got to, we've actually got to flip that number. So, because if they're running around with ideas and notions that they can't get clarity on, it's never going to get better. It's only going to get worse. Because what they're consuming is going to continue to exacerbate it. But thank you for that. I appreciate it. Any others? Yes. Did I see you with your hand up? No? Oh, okay. You're stretching? Okay. That's allowed. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would not shy away from it, right? We are not doing kids favors by placating and telling them what they want to hear, right? Don't shy away from being honest. You're not helping a kid. Accountability is huge. It's the one, the, probably the biggest thing that they're lacking these days, right? That's my son's issue, why he sits in a Georgia prison now. Never been held accountable. When I tried to hold him accountable, he left and ran over to my mom's house and my parents let him in. You know, so let these kids know, look, it's because I care about you that I'm giving you this direction, right? You know, I was honest with my son when I said, I don't want you to go back to Howard University. I don't think it's the right environment for you. And he didn't want to hear it. I said, you just got arrested on a gun charge in Chinatown. You, and you think it's the right environment for you to go back to because you got away with it? I said, do you realize this is a federal crime? I do because I'm paying the legal bill, right? It's not the right environment for you. So they have to understand that you care first, right? No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care, right? And that's the thing we've got to impress upon these parents is that, look, I, I'm calling because I want to help. I'm giving you this direction because I want to help your child succeed. I'm working with a young man right now. He would love to play football at Notre Dame, Penn State, right? USC, University of Georgia. But he's not physically able, not talented enough to go there and play. So let's dance with the girl that brung us. Right? We've got a couple of college visits set up this weekend. Let's embrace those opportunities because that's what we have right now. And that's where our talent level is taking us. So let's be honest with ourselves. And let's take advantage of this opportunity. Now, you may go to a Division II school and ball. And then you can get in the transfer portal and go to your dream school. But it's hard for us to look at reality and accept it. 
right? It's hard for parents to be realistic with their kids. But the hockey world is a great example, right? Everybody thinks they got the next great Gretzky living with them, right? Every hockey parent I've ever met, <laughs> oh yeah. Have you seen little Johnny over here? <laughs> He's got some slap shot. No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he does not. And so they set, up their, they set themselves and their children up for failure with these unrealistic expectations, right? And we used to go to Canada, right? Because if you, like, you know, if you want to go to and, and see what it is, let's go where they really know how to play. Let's size up the competition, right? Let's see where you stand. I would take them to Canada in the summers. We met an amazing coach up there who invited us up every summer to play with his team, team full of Canadians. And I was like, okay, go up here and learn, right? Obviously, you're not going to be the best guy on the team, but you will be able to see what it takes to be the best guy on the team. And you'll be able to understand what kind of work ethic these kids are putting in, right? Because it's a different attitude. and It's their national identity. And he learned so much from those summer tournaments, right? And I was like, dude, we got to get better. Like, we live in Atlanta, okay? You're trying to play hockey. Not a lot of hockey down here, in case you haven't noticed. All right? These kids live, eat, and sleep it up here. So if you can keep up with them, you might be on to something. And those experiences are what opened his eyes and made him realize, okay, yeah, I might be killing it down here, but up here, I'm just another guy. So I got to work harder. And I never had to go tell him to shoot pucks. I never had to go tell him to stick handle. I never had to go tell him to run through the neighborhood for a half an hour. Like he did all that stuff on his own. You know, he is a handsome, six foot three, good looking African American male in the land of the beautiful black woman in Atlanta. And he goes to bed at 9.30 every night. I know exactly where he is. They're beautiful women, period, in Atlanta. But I know exactly where he is because he's dedicated to his craft. And it's more important for him to rest and recover and to pursue his dream than it is for him to be out in the streets doing whatever. And so I constantly remind him how proud I am. And I said, you know, remember when I was honest with you? Remember when I told you what we needed to do in order to see what it was going to take for you to get from where you were to where you wanted to be? He's like, it all worked out, didn't it, Dad? I was like, yeah, we had a plan. We worked out a plan, and then we worked the plan. And you stuck to it. And now, look, you're getting a paycheck for it. Right? There's an old hockey saying, um, four check, back check, paycheck. Right? And now he's getting a paycheck on a regular basis and he's happy. He smiles when he's on that ice. And he likes to fight. He likes to smile while he's fighting. This is the weirdest thing. My wife can't stand it. But he's happy. But he's happy. And my goal as a parent was always to get my kids to their happy place. Where they could be proud of themselves and feel good about who they are. Thank you for that. Did I, did I answer? Okay. Don't be afraid to be honest. All right? And maybe you lead with a couple of compliments when you're talking to kids. And, hey, this is what you do really well. All right? This is what your child does really well. Help lower the... When, when you're complimenting people and their child, it, I mean, all you can do is lower the volume. Right? So start there. Start on the positive note. And then back into the conversation about why you think this is a fit. As opposed to, you know, going to Harvard. You know, maybe you want to try a different school. Maybe Temple is a better option. Right? Maybe Howard University is a better option. I'm not. I'm not killing Temple. <laughs> Temple's a great school. Just knocked off number one Houston. Temple's awesome. <laughs> But maybe it's a better option, right? The goal is still to get the degree. 
The goal is still to be a productive member of society. But you might have a better experience based on what the numbers are telling us and based on your performance to this point. Now, if they don't like the event, they can change the R. You could have worked a little harder, right? Then maybe you'd be IV material. Or maybe you start a temple and transfer to Harvard. That could happen. <laughs> but if you don't like the E, change the R. Any others? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? All right. Thank you all so much. What a pleasure to be here with you.